It's the focus of worldwide attention, the Great Plains Sinfields plant. What was once called a white elephant is now a workhorse. It turns lignite, a low rank coal, into natural gas. It makes chemicals and fertilizers, and it's part of a project so big it crosses international borders. The Sinfuels plant sends carbon dioxide to the largest carbon sequestration project in the world, in Canada, near Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Let's take a look at the Sinfuels plant's role in that project. The carbon dioxide sent to Canada is used for enhanced oil recovery. This was part of the Sinfuels concept from the beginning. The Great Plains Sinfuels plant was first envisioned by a group of energy companies in the 1970s. They hoped the plant would help ease the country's reliance on foreign oil. They also hoped to one day take carbon dioxide from the plant and market it for enhanced oil recovery. The plant's first synthetic natural gas was put into the pipe in 1984. Four years later, Basin Electric bought the plant and formed a subsidiary to operate it, Dakota Gasification Company. The company invested in the plant's future, improving environmental controls and developing byproducts to sell. By October 2000, Dakota Gasification had helped turn the plant's CO2 dream into reality. The first carbon dioxide was shipped through a 205-mile pipeline to Canadian oil fields, averaging about 95 million standard cubic feet a day. The gas was compressed by two eight-stage centrifugal GHH Borsig, now MAN turbo, compressors, each powered by 20,000 horsepower Alstom motors. The project was an economic success. In 2006, the Sinfuels plant expanded to send even more CO2. They installed an additional compressor and a Schlemberger 1500 horsepower booster pump at Tioga, North Dakota. It now sends about 150 million standard cubic feet per day to Canada. That's a little more than two thirds of what the plant produces when running at full rates. Someday, all of it could be sent to oil fields. This is how the process works. Golf ball to baseball sized coal chunks are fed into the top of 14 gasifiers at the rate of about 55 tons an hour for each one. Steam and oxygen are added to the bottom. The steam and oxygen slowly rise, reacting with the coal to produce a raw gas. The raw gas then goes through a process to convert it to natural gas and separate out other products including carbon dioxide. In the years before the CO2 was captured, it was sent to the boilers to recover its BTU value and sulfur compounds. The remaining CO2 was released through the stack. My name is Myra Perry. I'm a process engineer at Dakota Gasification. Recovering CO2 at Dakota Gasification is made easy by a process we have called Rectosol. In the towers behind me, very cold methanol is used to absorb the CO2 from a gas stream. This methanol needs to be regenerated for future use, so it's flashed from a high pressure to a very low pressure, liberating the CO2. From here, the CO2 is sent over to the compression unit, where it's compressed to 2,700 pounds of pressure. This CO2 is unique from the flue gas emitted from a power plant in that it is oxygen and nitrogen free, 96% pure, and it's dry. The pipeline consists of 12 and 14 inch diameter carbon steel pipe. It has several taps along the way, making it possible to sell CO2 to more locations in the future. The pipeline runs along the western edge of North Dakota, crossing the Little Missouri River, Lake Sakakawea, and the Canadian border on its way to Weyburn. From a regulatory perspective, the CO2 is considered a hazardous liquid. As such, the pipeline falls under 49 CFR Part 195 on the American side and CSA Z662 on the Canadian side. These regulations govern the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of hazardous liquid pipelines. Hi, I'm Darren Eliasson, one of the process engineers here at Dakota Gasification. We're here in the CO2 Pipeline Control Center where the pipeline operation is monitored. A 
various points along the pipeline, there are many different pressure, temperature, and flow transmitters that monitor the conditions in the pipeline. This information is transmitted back to the plant every five seconds through a series of microwave, radio, and landlines. All of this information is displayed here on the leak detection computer. We call it the LDS for short. The computer uses this information to determine if a leak might be present in the system. It can also estimate the size and location of a leak. All of this information is then sent over to this screen on the main plant Fox Pro control system. An audible alarm is also generated if a, if a potential leak is suspected. The operators can then use this information to do further investigation, or if necessary, they can shut down the pipeline. They can also use remotely operated valves to isolate a specific section of the pipeline where the leak might be occurring. These valves are located no further than 20 miles apart all the way along the pipeline. So we're at the end of the pipeline, brings the CO2 from DGC's plant in Beulah up to our oil field here near Weyburn, Saskatchewan. We're injecting CO2 into 100 injection wells, supports 300 producing wells, and without the CO2 injection, we'd be producing 10,000 barrels a day. We've seen our production grow to close to 30,000 barrels a day since injecting CO2. Dakota Gasification voluntarily files Form EIA 1605B each year with the United States Department of Energy. This is the long form for voluntary reporting of greenhouse gases. It reports the total sequestered amount of CO2, including deductions for indirect CO2 increases, like electricity required to run auxiliary equipment and CO2 flared at the oil fields. The results are audited by an independent third party. After accounting for deductions, about 70% of Dakota Gasification's total sales volume is sequestered. Through 2007, about 13 million tons of CO2 have been sent to Canada. Nine million tons have been sequestered. It's the only project like it in the world. More oil, less CO2, proven economics, and unprecedented monitoring. The Sinfuels plant, helping shape the world's energy future.